Hey everyone, Kevin from MechanicalAdvantage.com. I wanted to use this video to help those that are transitioning from AutoCAD to Fusion, as well as those that have never used AutoCAD to understand why people who use AutoCAD moving to Fusion kind of have a hard time with the transition. I was in the same boat roughly 20 years ago when I moved from AutoCAD to Inventor. I was very proficient in AutoCAD and I struggled pretty hard with the transition over to Inventor and I thought I would try to make a video to help them transition for some of the people I see struggling online. So here you can see I am in AutoCAD. Uh, I'm using the Mac right now, but it's basically the same version of AutoCAD and works the same way. I wanna kinda show the difference between how you draw an AutoCAD and what we do inside of Fusion. So I'm just gonna start out with a simple example of drawing a line. And I wanna say I wanna start that line at the coordinate system of five comma five and hit enter. And I want this line to be roughly five inches long. So I'm just gonna drag the direction I wanna go, enter five and hit enter and enter one more time. And there I have my five inch long line. I know where this line starts, I know where it ends, I know its angle, I know everything about this line. If I want to do anything else with this line, I have to use a command like the move command or use the grips or scale or rotate. I have to use some modifier command to make this line move. And if I start the dimension command and I click on the dimension, I click on the line, the dimension reports how long the line is. And if I use a command like stretch or scale, so I'm just gonna say S for, uh, let me just use the grip. I'll click on this and grab the grip. I'm gonna stretch this out one inch. Now you'll see the dimension updates to tell me that this line is now six inches from the five inches that it was. So in AutoCAD, we draw things exactly the way we want them to be. We can draw lots of detail. And when we're done drawing a drawing in AutoCAD, we don't really understand how the person created it, constructed it. We don't know the tools that they used. Did they mirror it? Did they rotate it? Did they pattern it? Did they draw every entity individually? We don't have the history like we do inside of Fusion. All we get is the net geometry at the very end of the part. So let me switch over and show how things are a little bit different inside of Fusion. So I'm gonna hop over to Fusion and I just have a blank drawing file. So I'm gonna start a new sketch. I'll put it on the front plane and I'm just gonna draw a line from point to point. Now let me, I got an extra line in there. Let me do that one more time. So draw a line just somewhere to somewhere. And if I look at this line, I don't know where the line starts. I don't know where the line ends. I have no idea what the angle of the line is and I don't know the length of the line. I can just click on this line and change anything, any part about that line and to move it around. The only thing I know about this line is it has the qualities of a line, uh, two points connected uh, between them. And so what I need to start to do is add constraints and dimensions so that I know more things about this line. And the first constraint that I'm gonna talk about is the coincident constraint. Now I should back up for one second. Constraints are just geometric relationships between two Two or more things. Most of the time you're going to do it between two things. We'll see with some examples here where I'll do it between multiple things at the same time. So the coincident constraint is just going to take two things and make their points or their, their endpoints common. So I'll click on the endpoint of the line and the origin point. Now a thing to note is the origin point is fixed and can't move. So the thing that can move has to move to the thing that can't move. So there's my line. I can still move this. I don't know how long it is. I don't know what angle it is. The only thing I know about it is it starts at zero, zero. So I'm going to kind of move this line roughly about right here. The next constraint I want to talk about is the horizontal vertical constraint. And the reason I moved that line right there is because that's a terrible place to put this line to explain the horizontal vertical constraint. I don't know if this line was drawn greater than 45 degrees or if it's less than 45 degrees. However, if I apply the horizontal vertical constraint, it will move it to whatever it's closest to, zero or 90. When I click on that, you can see that I drew that line under 45 degrees. So I'm going to undo that and I'll just click on this and cheat it up a little bit. And now if I do the same thing, it moves it to 90 degrees. Another interesting thing has happened with this line. If we look at it, it was all blue. Now the line is black except for the endpoint. And that's because I know where this line starts. I know its angle, it's 90 degrees or vertical, but I don't know how long it is. So if I add another dimension, or if I add a dimensions, I should say, and I call this and I tell the line to be five, the dimension is telling the line how long to be. Whereas in AutoCAD, the dimension reported how long the line was and the line was the driver. In this case, the dimension's the driver of the geometry. So now I can see that I've got a line that starts at zero, zero. It's vertical, it has a length of five, I know everything about this line, so it turns fully black or fully defined to let me know that everything about this sketch is defined. So I have some other simple examples like that I thought I would go through. I'm just gonna close this out and not save it and get to my next tab. So what I have here is I wanna do an example of parallel. So I'm gonna do about the same thing. I'm just gonna add a, 
I'm just gonna add a coincident constraint between the endpoint and the origin, and then I wanna draw another line in here. Now, when I draw that other line, that certainly wasn't parallel. So I'll start the parallel constraint, and I'll click on my two lines, and now they become parallel. However, note as I just kind of keep moving this around, know what happens. The one on the right keeps getting shorter and shorter and shorter the more I move it. Nothing in the rules that says it has to say the same length. So Fusion is, the, the sketch solver is just doing whatever it needs to do in order to maintain that parallel relationship, but that's the only one it's maintaining. So what I might do in this case is, let's pretend we're gonna make something like windshield wipers. Well, my windshield wipers aren't moving so well right now. They're not like, acting like the windshield wipers on a car. So the next constraint I might add is the horizontal and vertical. Now remember, before I added the horizontal or vertical to an align Line entity. This time I'm going to add it between points. So I'm going to say between this point and this end point. And now things are going to start to move a little bit better. I still am not changing length. The line is starting to shuffle a little bit more side to side, but it worked a little bit better. So let me go grab an equal constraint between these two. Now uh, starting to get a little bit better, right? I'm starting to get more and more consistent movement. I'll add a dimension between these two endpoints and place it, maybe we'll call this five inches as well. Now you start to see that things are starting to work more and more reliably. I can still change this to be however long I want it to be. So maybe I'll add one more dimension. Let me go grab this as a dimension of five inches as well. And now I'll start to see that things are moving pretty well, pretty consistently. If I wanted to fully define this, uh, I could draw another line. Maybe I'll make this construction as my driver and I'll come up here and I'll do a dimension between this line and this line, and I'll say that that's 25 degrees. Now everything is black and fully constrained. It's fully defined because all the parts of it are defined, so everything turns black, and I can't change it unless I change a dimension, delete a dimension, or delete a constraint. That's why we call it fully constrained. I'll delete this off, and the next example I wanna kinda of show you is the tangent constraint. So here you can see I got a line going to an arc, going back to another line, and the transition between those isn't very good. So I'm gonna start the tangent constraint, click on the line and the arc, and then the line and the other arc, and you can see I get a nice flow between those. And as I move things around, it maintains that relationship. It's moving as it wants to, uh, but it's maintaining that tangent relationship as we go. So it's it's maybe a little hard to drag around and do things. Next thing I wanted to show is I can make two circles tangent. So there's the tangency point. And I can also make an arc and a circle and an arc and a circle tangent. You can see everything moved around, but those points are now all tangent. I've got no real dimensions to constrain how they can move, so I can still change their size and location, but we maintain that tangent relationship. So you can add tangents between lines and circles, lines and arcs, arcs and arcs, arcs and circles. You have all kinds of tangent options. So close out the tangent constraint and move on to the next one. Next one is equal. I like to say fusion is a verb noun or a noun verb program. The verb noun means I'm gonna select the equal constraint and then I'm gonna select two things or more things that I want to be equal. So there I just made those two circles equal. I'll undo that. The reason I say it's a noun verb is because I can select the things that I want to participate first as the noun, and then I can go grab the verb. Now an interesting thing happens when I do it this way, Fusion rules out constraints that don't make sense. So in this case, I can use equal, fix, and concentric. That's all it's gonna let me do here. Uh, so if I grab the equal constraint, it makes them all equal at the same time. It shows one of the circles, probably the first one I clicked on to make them all equal to. Let me just undo that a couple times. Note that I have this circle over here that's two inches. It's defined as being two inches. So if I hold my control or my command button down again and I select all these circle entities, I can even do these two arcs at the same time. And I grab the equal constraint. Now as I dimension any of them, their dimension is gonna show up as two inches because they were all made equal at the same time. And that's because this circle had the uh, dimension placed on it, so all the ones that don't have a dimension have to match the ones that do. So I'll close out the equal constraint. Let's move over to the concentric constraint. Pretty simple. Uh, you can you can also use the coincident constraint. Kind of does the same thing, but I'm just gonna choose uh, concentric between maybe this arc and this circle. And now you can see that that circle moves the center of the arc. And if I do the same thing between these two circles, they all have the same common uh, point. I can change the diameter or the radiuses of any of them, but notice as I move one, all of them also move along. Maybe I'll drag that down to the center point. Now they're all concentric to the center point, and I see that concentric uh, constraint symbol. I won't save that. I'm going to come over here. This one's going to be the midpoint constraint, so I'm going to say I want to use the midpoint between the endpoint of this line and the midpoint of that line, and now uh, we that line gets placed at the end. Notice if I, if I come and grab this line and I change its length, 
it still maintains that midpoint constraint even though I'm changing it around. I may want that to work a little bit differently, so I grab the perpendicular constraint between these two. Now I have my perpendicular constraint. And if I were to add a dimension of this line, maybe I'll say that this line is five inches. Well then, if everything is working okay, this distance between the endpoint and endpoint should be 2.5 inches. Now an interesting thing is gonna happen when I dimension this and I place this, it shows me it's 2.5, but I'm gonna get a warning that says, wait a minute now, adding this sketch is gonna over constrain the sketch. So press okay to create a driven dimension. If this line is five and this line's at the midway point, the only dimension this can be is two and a half. It couldn't be five inches at the midpoint and three inches at the same time. That, that doesn't, that's a conflict. So I'll hit okay. And know that that dimension appears in parentheses. I'm gonna show you another way you can do this. Let me just delete this uh, midpoint constraint, sorry. I'm just doing that by right clicking on it and choosing delete. So I'm still perpendicular. I'll just move this around so you can see that it can still move. And I'm gonna add a coincident constraint since I broke that midpoint constraint, just so that these two things are touching. So you can see this can move anywhere. Now what I could do is this is five. I could just say from this point to this point and place it and say that's 2.5. Problem solved, I'm at the midpoint, I know I am. However, if I change this dimension to be six, I'm no longer at the midpoint. And eventually if you try to use this method, you're going to forget and it's gonna cause you an issue, especially if you're dealing with production out on the shop floor. So I'm gonna delete that and show you a different way we can do this. I'm gonna start the dimension command and click on the endpoint and the endpoint, and I'm gonna place this dimension, but notice I'm not typing another value. I'm gonna reference this first dimension by clicking on it. And it says that dimension is now equal to D1 and I want this to be at the midpoint. So I'm gonna say divide by two and enter. And that dimension is going to be three. I'm gonna see this FX in front of it, letting me know it's a function or relation to something else. If I come back now and I change this to be seven, notice that other dimension updates to be 3.5. So there's another formulaic way you can do that with dimensions inside of your sketches. I'm gonna close this out and move to this. This is the collinear. My goal here is I want this line and this line to lie in the same plane. So I'm gonna grab the collinear constraint, click on one, click on the other, it moves the second one down to the first one. And if I were to move the first one around, the second one moves along with it. If I undo that and I add a dimension here and I call this 3.5, now, sorry, let me try that again, 3.5. Now if I do that same collinear dimension and I click on here, a constraint, and I click on this and this. The one that can move has to move the one that can't move because this one's defined, this one wasn't, so it has to move that way. So that's the collinear constraint. The fixed constraint is one I would rather you not use. We can fix an entire line. Sorry, I'm gonna grab the fix, unfix. I can grab an entire line, notice it turns green, and I can't move it anymore. You'll also notice that when you bring in an SVG file, everything comes in as green, and that just means the geometry is all fixed. That's why SVG files generally perform a little bit better inside of sketches than DXF files do. I'm gonna draw a window around everything and unfix it. I could click on the endpoint. So now you can see that I can change anything about this line, but I can't change the endpoint. I'll undo that get that uh, taken off, and I'm gonna fix or unfix just the line point. Now you can see I can change the, ang the length of the line, but I fixed the angle in space. So that's a fix constraint. Again, generally, stay away from that one. I'll close this out and say don't save. Now, here's a symmetry constraint. So if I move this side or this side, notice that there's no relationship. What I'm hoping is that each side kind of moves, looks the same way. So I'm gonna use the symmetry constraint. I'm gonna click the one on the left and then the right and then the one in the center. I could reverse that order as well. I wanna choose the things I wanna be symmetric to each other and the thing that I want them to be symmetric about. Now, just because they're symmetric doesn't mean that they have to be equal in length. Notice that I can change the, the length, but the angle is going to be the same. I could also add an equal constraint between these two and, and do that. So I recommend you not use the mirror constraint because when you do that, you're adding lots of symmetry here to your sketch. I use symmetry sparingly and I try not to use the mirror constraint at all if I can because I will just draw half of whatever I'm going to do and mirror that as a solid rather than a sketch entity you get better performance that way. So I'll close this out and I'm gonna say don't save. Now last one, I'm gonna edit the sketch. Uh, this is the little revolve part that I do in the classes. And when I look at this, it looks pretty bad to start out with. I can say I've got one parallel constraint and that's about it. So I'm gonna add the a vertical constraint, a horizontal constraint to the bottom. I'll add a vertical constraint. This one's parallel, so that's gonna be vertical. I'll add a horizontal constraint there, a horizontal constraint there, and a vertical constraint there. So now I've got this kind of fixed up the way I want. I'm gonna use a vertical constraint between the endpoint of these two lines to get those lined up on the Y axis, the way I want it to be. And now I can start adding dimensions. Noted that this is a center line, so I'm gonna get a 
center line dimension when I do this. I'm gonna work in diameters even though I only draw in half. I'm gonna start the dimension and I'm gonna say the dimension between here and here is going to be three inches. Now when I do that, sometimes what'll happen is your sketch uh, starts to sort of turn inside out. So this dimension here is going to be 2.65. There's a good example of those things crossing. So now I gotta kind of pull this back into line how I want it to be. I'll add another dimension between here and this. I want this to be seven. I added the three inch to the wrong spot. Sorry, let me do that over again. Between here and here is three. This dimension is gonna be 7.75. And this dimension, again, things kind of went inside out a little bit on me, not too bad in this case, but this dimension is going to be nine. And now I get the shape that I want and I just have to add my last uh, 2.65, 2.65, and there would be, sorry, this one should be three, and this one should be 2.65. So you can see the sketch engine works, um, wouldn't allow me to do that. So now I have a fully defined sketch. I'm gonna finish the sketch and I'm gonna go to this other file I have here called Scale by, by Dim. I'm gonna go to my preferences and what I wanna do is go to the design tab when this comes up and I wanna turn on scale entire sketch at first dimension. Hit apply and okay. Now I'm gonna go through to do the same steps I did in the last sketch. This is just a duplicate of it. So I'll use my horizontal vertical constraints to square things up here. Grab those oh, entities, click on the endpoint and the origin. There, we're all good. Now note, when I go and I dimension this, I hit D for dimension between here and here, and this is going to be my three inch dimension. Notice it scaled my entire sketch to keep it proportionally the same. Now I can go grab uh, this dimension and I'll call this 7.75. Things didn't flip around on me this time. This is gonna be 2.65. This dimension is going to be three, and this dimension is going to be nine. And I have a fully black and defined sketch. So note that scaling by the first sketch, uh, by the first sketch dimension, kept everything proportionally the same, and I didn't sort of get my entities kind of turning inside out like they did in the first example. I'm gonna go ahead and finish the sketch. I hope that gives you an understanding of sometimes why AutoCAD users might struggle moving over to Fusion. Just the fundamental difference between things don't move in AutoCAD until you tell them to, and in Fusion, things can move until you fully constrain them and add dimensions until they can't move. So that's a big change between those two things. In AutoCAD, geometry tells the dimension how big it needs to be. In Fusion, the dimension tells the geometry how big it should be. So kind of it's kind of a role reversal about how the two programs work. I hope this was helpful. I've got a lot of great emails from you guys lately, so I really appreciate the emails. Keep the comments coming. Uh, if you have any comments or questions on this video, please leave them below. And as always, thanks for watching.